make friends with people who want the best for you. I had friends who wanted the best for me and friends who didn't. And, you know, they were friends who, some of them were aiming up and some of them were aiming down. And if you have a friend that's aiming down and you do something that's aiming up, then they're generally not that happy about it, you know. They try to top your accomplishment with one of their own hypothetical or real or put down what you're doing or offer you a cigarette if you're trying to quit and you've kind of done that successfully or a drink if you've been drinking too much and are just trying to stop being an alcoholic, you know. Or, yeah, they're cynical and bitter and, and devoted towards no good. And sometimes that's family members too. And sometimes it's even part of you, you know. But like you have an ethical responsibility to take care of yourself, you have an ethical responsibility to surround yourself with people who have the courage and faith and wisdom to wish you well when you've done something good and to stop you when you're doing something destructive. And if your friends aren't like that, then they're not your friends. And maintaining your friendships with them might not even be in their interest. Be careful about whom you share good news with. And another was be careful about whom you share bad news with. A friend is someone you can share good news with, you know. You go to them and you say, hey, look, this good thing happened to me. And, and they say, look, I'm so happy that that happened to you. Like, way to be. And they don't think, God damn it, why didn't that happen to me? And like, you know, you didn't deserve it. Here's a bunch of reasons you're stupid and why it won't work. It's like, that's not helpful. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Because... You want to present yourself to the world in a manner that, that doesn't disgrace you in some sense. That, that might be a good way to think about it. And you don't want to disgrace yourself because the consequence of disgrace is, is emotional dysregulation. More pain, less positive emotion. And so the best way to present yourself is to stand up forthrightly and to stretch out, you know, and to occupy some space. And to you, you make yourself sort of vulnerable by doing that because you open up the front of your body, right? But it's a sign of confidence. And that way people are most likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's a good way to start regulating your mood. But not only does it directly regulate your mood to stand up, but also because if you straighten up and you present yourself in that manner, then other people are more likely to take you seriously. And that's another way that you can at least give yourself the bloody benefit of the doubt, right? And confront the world in a courageous manner. And that's a really good way of also of figuring out how to establish yourself in multiple competence hierarchies because one of the general rules of thumb about how to be successful is to confront things that frighten you forthrightly and with courage. And that's kind of a universal strategy for success. There's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And that's a problem because you can get jealous and you can get bitter and you can get resentful. And worse, you can get hopeless, you know. I have this, this friend of mine. He told me something so funny. He was decrying his, his lack of success in the world. And he compared himself to his roommate. And uh, he said, you know, his roommate, his college roommate was doing much better than he was. And his bloody roommate was Elon Musk. It's like, it wasn't like he was doing badly. Like he was doing pretty damn well. It's like, I'm not as good as Elon Musk. It's like, yeah, well, you and like seven billion other people, you know. <laughs> but, but I thought it was instructive because you have to be careful who you compare yourself to. Now, you can't just not compare yourself to others, to successful people, right? Because then you don't have anything to aim at. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge, and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient? And this is something I've had to work out a lot as a clinical psychologist. It's like, well, let's say you need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So. You gotta set up a goal and then you gotta make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is, and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal difficult but proximal. So your goal is 
to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. Think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. Well, th that's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. You can actually implement it, and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. And I've seen that happen in people's lives over and over. People write me all the time and tell me that they're doing that, but I've seen that happen to, in people's lives continually. They make a goal. The goal should be, how could I conceive of my life so that if I had that life, it would clearly be worth living, so I wouldn't have to be bitter, resentful, deceitful, arrogant, and vengeful. Like, that's sort of the bottom line, right? Because that's what endless failure does to you. It's not good. And that's what life without purpose and a goal does to you as well, because life is very hard. So you think, okay, well, I need to adopt a mode of being that would justify my suffering. And you can ask yourself that question. What would make this worthwhile? He who has a why can bear almost any how. That's a lovely line, man. I mean, it's a lovely line. And it's really worth thinking about. So you think, well... How, how do I manage all this misery and suffering and futility? It's like, well, I need to figure out what I would have to do in order to make that clearly worthwhile. And so then you have your goal and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. And that'll propel you forward very rapidly. And, and you can succeed at it, which is also really lovely, because why not set yourself up for success, you know? Why people don't like themselves very much. And I think there's two reasons, really. And one is that we're fragile and damageable and imperfect in multiple dimensions all the time. And that often just gets worse. It, Lots of things get worse as you get old, for example. So it's not necessarily that easy for a self-conscious being who's... extraordinarily aware of his or her own fragility but not just fragility um, foolishness and errors like you know yourself better than anyone else knows you and you know you you might have a certain amount of uh, dislike for someone you know because of something they did but you know everything you did and then so there's that it's like you're weak and kind of useless and prone to temptation and you know all those things you know, that just shouldn't be that way. And then you're also capable of pretty vicious acts of malevolence. And so you also know that about yourself. And so it's a real existential question for people. It's like, why the hell should you take care of something as sorry and wretched as you are? The answer is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're, first of all, yes, you're pretty useless and terrible, but so is everyone else. And that's actually an existential problem, right? And what I mean by that, it's a problem that every human being has always had and always will. So it's not just you. It's a universal problem. And there's an answer to that. And one of them is to love the sinner but hate the sin. It's something like that. Is that despite the fact that you're not all that you could be, the proper attitude to have towards yourself is the attitude that you would have towards someone that you genuinely cared for. And that it's incumbent on you to act as if you genuinely care for yourself. Just like you would act 
towards someone that you actually cared about, some other person. And so it's a reversal in some sense of the golden rule, right? And it's a discussion of why that's necessary. And also, more than that, it's a discussion of why, why you have a moral obligation to do that. It's not just that you should because it would be better for you. It's, you actually have a moral obligation to do that, I think, because you make the world a much worse place if you don't take care of yourself. So you should bloody well take care of yourself, you know, because it's partly because you have something valuable to bring into the world. That's the thing about being an individual. It's the thing that Western civilization has always recognized, that as an individual, you have a light that you have to bring into the world. And that if you don't bring it into the world, the world is a dimmer place. And that's a bad thing, because when the world is a dim place, it can get very, very, very dark. Not just so that you feel better. None, none of those things. You need to take care of yourself because you're in the best position to do that. And it's necessary for you to take care of yourself. Despite the fact that we're mortal and vulnerable and self-conscious and capable, not only capable of doing terrible things, but actually do them. Despite all that, you still have that responsibility. One of the things that Jung said about the shadow, which is the dark side of humanity, the dark side of each individual, was that its roots reached all the way to hell. And so what he meant was that if you were able to understand your dark side, then you would see in yourself a reflection of the behavior that was, that was present at Auschwitz, for example. And that the reason that people don't take the dark side of themselves seriously at all, and even confront the fact that it exists, is because no one wants to see that reflected within them. And no wonder.